session is over. Um, so let me just get started. Okay, so because I'm, so um, I'm going to give a disclaimer first, um, just on behalf of Carol. Um, so Carol has provided an opportunity for the Physician Financial Independence Facebook group and Breaking Bad Debt, that's me, to address its membership. Any information, views, or opinions expressed are solely those of the presenter and their company and do not necessarily represent those of Paro. As always, Paro members are encouraged to explore other options which may be available to them. So it's just, I have to say that. Um, I just want to make some acknowledgements. So in order to make this event free and accessible to residents and medical students, um, this all the food has been uh, funded by uh, Toronto Parasite. As well, um, I'd like to thank U of T Medical Society for covering the room bookings. Um, and special thanks to the medical students who helped me with this event. So specifically Krish, um, Christina, Nathan, and Kay Savan over there at MAM. Um, so this is just a discussion outline for today. So between seven, like 7.10 to 7.45, um, we'll be talking about tax tips for residency and practice, basics of investing, um, top financial mistakes made by doctors, and transition to practice, so incorporation. Um, from 7.45 to 9, there will be a roundtable and discussion, so this is your chance to ask a lot of questions that you have. Um, and just for ma'am, if you're at ma'am, you can press the blue, like the silver button in front of you if you do have a question, and it will be relayed over to us. So during the question period, I'll be splitting um, the question time between the people here. Um, it's a full house here pretty much and um, between the people at NAM as well. Okay. So I just want to introduce um, Dr. Jane Healy and Dr. Paul Healy, uh, who created the Physician Financial Independence Facebook group. Um, so Dr. Jane Healy is a hospital-based pediatrician at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga and a U of T 0T1 graduate. Uh, Mr. Paul Healy is an emergency physician at Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. Together, they created the Physician Financial Independence Online Community in 2017, which now has over 17,400 members. It is a space where physicians can teach each other about personal finance that does not accept any advertising and is free from industry bias. Jane and Paul are strong advocates for promoting financial literacy and reducing burnout in medicine. They pride themselves on being a neutral, non-biased source of information for Canadian physicians. And I'm uh, Dr. Steph Zhao. I'm one of the para reps um, who organizes this event. And you can find me on Instagram too. I blog about financial stuff. Um, so just some disclosures. Um, Dr. Paul Healy is on the Physicians Advisory Committee of the OMA. Um, I have no disclosures. Okay, so I'll bring, um, please give a warm welcome for um, Dr. Jane and Paul, and they're going to start their presentation. All right, wow, I, it's overwhelming for us to see a room full of all of you that want to come in, uh, hear us speak, and we're grateful to, to Steph and, and all of you that have organized this event. Um, it, it's really great for us to see the interest um, from, from people wanting to learn about personal finance because as Steph mentioned, this is a topic we're really passionate about. We've met lots of physician colleagues in all stages of their careers that really have told us, you know, we wish we had had this education earlier on because we've made lots of mistakes. So hopefully we can, we can pass on some information that you'll find useful. All right, so Stephanie's gonna cover the resident tax resources and then I'll come back. Yeah. Um, so just so you guys know, um, being members of PARO, um, there are, we recently sent out the tax primer for you guys. So um, I recently filed my taxes this weekend and I'm sure a lot of you guys will be doing that yourselves. So just things to keep in mind that are very special to people in medicine. Like for, for example, um, like union dues or your MCCQE exam, um, those are all uh, things that could be deducted on your tax returns. So take a look at the payroll tax tips. And um, we've also prepared a financial primer on the payroll website um, that covers tax return stuff, insurance stuff, um, as well as like salary related things on there as well. So take a look at that too. 
Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, so it's already March, so uh, April 30th, that's when your tax, tax returns are due. Um, and uh, these are just some information on making sure to file taxes early, just because there will be a 5% penalty if you file late. Make sure you keep all your receipts when it comes to tax returns. Um, and just for some people who might be a bit more beginner when it comes to tax returns, um, some people have asked me what's the difference between credit, a tax credit and a tax deduction. <coughs> and so a tax credit basically reduces the amount of tax you owe at the end, and a tax deduction reduces the kind of tax bracket that you're in. So if you have a tax deduction, it might reduce you from paying 24% tax to 20% tax. So that's just to clarify for some people who aren't, who aren't sure. And I'm going to pass it on back on to Jane. Okay, so you finish your residency and you're going to be transitioning to being staff. So some considerations to keep in mind. So when you are paid as a resident, you receive a salary, which means that your income tax is deducted automatically, right? And if you look closely at your slip that you get, you'll see a spot there where they've automatically deducted the income tax and submitted it to the government on your behalf. So tax returns are pretty easy when you're a resident and then when you file your taxes in March or April, it's pretty straightforward. However, um, things get a bit more complicated when you become staff. And we really feel that hiring an accountant for most people is really essential because oftentimes you may not know what you don't know. So you may be missing out on deductions that you're eligible for. And unless you're working with an accountant who can point this out to you, you may miss out on deductions um, that, uh, that are available for you. So what, what does an accountant do? So I think most of us know that accountants prepare our tax returns and they are actually probably the most important financial professional that you're going to work with in your career. You often meet with them um, about once a year, but often we'll sort of email our accountant or talk to our accountant on the phone a few times a year if we have a specific question. And people ask us, you know, this a very frequent uh, point of discussion in our group, how much should I be paying an accountant? Because there's big variation. And generally, the less complicated your taxes are, so when you are um, early in practice, maybe you're not running your own private clinic, um, and if you're very organized with your receipts, like Steph mentioned, you know, keep all your receipts for your exams. If you're very organized, you may pay, you know, $1,500 a year or even less. It's also very geographic in high cost of living areas like here or in Vancouver, people report having to pay higher fees to their accountants. And certainly, if your taxes are more complicated, once you're incorporated, we'll talk more about that later. If you're less organized, you know, you present your accountant with a shoebox full of receipts and things are all over the place, they're going to spend more time sorting through all of that and will charge you for that time. So you can pay upwards of 5000 or more per year. So what are some tips? Well, um, we feel like choosing an accountant with experience with physicians is really, really important. And the main reason is, and again, you'll see these discussions in our group if, if, if you join or if you follow it, is that often people will have debates about, well, is this deductible? Can I write this off? And oh, my accountant said you can't, and my accountant said you can. And so this is, it's, there's a lot of gray areas in the tax code. And as with the schedule of benefits, which you'll be familiar with when you're fee for service billing, things can be gray and not all that straightforward. So having an accountant that's worked with a lot of physicians who can sort of interpret these gray areas is really, really valuable. Because really, you don't want to sell yourself short and not write off things that are totally reasonable. But at the same time, you don't want to flag yourself for a CRA audit. You certainly don't want auditors uh, from the government after you. So as I already mentioned, you want to stay organized to reduce your costs. And then later on, once your practice becomes more complicated, perhaps you have a private office and you have employees, you're having to, to do payroll and many more things to keep track of, you might consider hiring a bookkeeper. So this isn't an accountant. This is a different person you hire that basically keeps things organized. And that is um, someone that can then help you present all of your finances nicely organized to the accountant. Um, we've been hearing some accountants are offering something called audit protection insurance. 
most accountants um, will say that this is a bit of a money grab, so be a little bit careful about that. Essentially, what they're saying is, you know, pay us $500, $700 a year, and if you are audited, then we will cover the cost of the audit up to a certain amount. So the, the truth of the matter is that most physicians will not be audited, especially if you have a good accountant that's not doing bizarre things. And so uh, it's probably a bit of a money grab. So just, to, just something to think about. So once you're staff, most physicians will be what's, what's termed self-employed, meaning that um, you're going to be paid some variation of fee for service meaning you provide a service to the patient and you bill for it. You may become part of a practice model where there's an alternate funding plan, uh, but ultimately it comes down to having provided services to patients. And the most important thing to understand is that your income that you receive is not going to be automatically deducted like when you're a resident. And so you have to remember the money that you get deposited into your bank account is not all your money. Some of that is the government's money and they're gonna want that money. And so you wanna be prepared for that so it's not going to be a big surprise. And so ultimately every year this happens with new staff, they get their OHIP billings, you know, they finish residency, they become staff on July 1st, they start working and then they work for a few months and then come April, it's their first tax return as staff and they've had all this income coming into their bank account and they think, oh wow, this is awesome. I finally am making grown up doctor money, finally. And sometimes that might lead to uh, some purchases. And uh, unfortunately our, our gift is being covered by the, uh, by the window, but you can see that this owner loves his Tesla so much, he's not only like, panning over the grill, but also massaging the front of the car and he loves it so much. So come tax day, you don't want this to happen, right? You want to be prepared for that very first tax bill and, uh, and know that it's coming. So generally, if you set aside about 30% of your income and think of that as not your money, but the government's money, you'll be fine. And a good place to park it is if you have a line of credit, you can just throw it onto your line of credit. You'll be essentially saving the interest that you otherwise would have been charged. And, or if you don't have a line of credit, you're, you're fortunate enough not to have any debt, then you can park it in a high interest savings account. That's, this isn't money that's wise to invest because you're going to need it to come April, right? So you, you want it um, easily accessible. And then after your first tax return of staff, CRA is gonna say, well, listen, you know, we don't want you to have essentially a tax, a, an interest-free loan from us for a whole year. We're going to put you on installments. So then CRA will notify you and will say, you know, we wanna be paid four times a year. And generally these installments come March, June, September, and December. And so your tax bill is still large, but it's large divided by four installments. But again, you have to plan for those and know that they're coming. So let's talk about some basics of investing. And I know some of you, this will be very, very um, basic knowledge, but we've come to understand that uh, even a lot of our colleagues, a lot of staff physicians, sometimes don't understand these basics. So we'll cover them quickly. So let's first talk about your investment vehicles. So uh, people have heard terms RSPs, TFSAs, but, but what are they? So they're not something that you go and purchase at the bank, that you invest in some, an investment called an RRSP. Think of these as banks or different accounts where you then place your investments. So an RRSP stands for a Registered Retirement Savings Plan. And what it is, is it's a tax deferral vehicle that's designed to encourage Canadians to save for their retirement. And so this is great for us because we're not gonna be getting a pension like some Canadians who earn a salary and have benefits. Most of us will not have one. So we're responsible for our own retirement savings. And so when you earn a salary, you actually earn our RSP contribution room. And so um, it's being blocked there, but 
your PGY1 salary will actually give you about $10,000 in RRSP contribution room. Um, it's 18% of your salary up to a maximum of $27,230 for 2020. That maximum changes each year, but it's 18% of your salary up to a certain maximum. So this year for 2020, you would need a salary of about $150,000 in order to reach that maximum RRSP contribution room. If you don't use it this year, no worries, it carries over and accumulates. So why is this a good thing? So you can contribute money to an RRSP and it becomes tax sheltered. Well, what does that mean? That means that you don't have to pay taxes on what the investments earn and then these are allowed to grow within this tax sheltered account. So this graph shows you that Basically, the purple line is an RRSP, and this is over 25-year 20, uh, period. If you're investing $6,000 annually at a 5% return, at the end of that time period, your RRSP is worth 300000 300, and a non-registered account, a taxable account where you would have had to pay taxes on the investment earnings, is worth $215,000. So this is just... That difference comes from the fact that your investment growth is tax sheltered and therefore can grow more quickly over time. So when you make an RSP contribution, you can take a tax deduction. And so um, it's really important to understand marginal tax rates in Canada because we have, we have different tax rates at different income brackets. So if you look at, say, for example, the, the, the first, well, this one's blocked, but say if you're on amounts you earn between 89,000 and 92,000, on those, that amount, you pay about 33% tax. Now, if you look at the highest tax bracket, so anything over $220,000 that you earn, you're paying 53% in tax. Okay, so again, remember, this isn't if you make over 220,000, it doesn't mean you pay 53% on everything you earn. At each tax bracket, you pay this amount. So you'd have to then calculate what your average tax rate is. And so the reason you may wanna carry over your RRSP contribution room is, it's best if you write it off, you use it when you are in this highest tax bracket because you get the biggest savings, right? Because you're in, um, in this 53% tax bracket. So remember, RSPs are tax deferred, they're not tax free. When you eventually take this money out later on, you will pay tax. Again, the amount of tax you pay goes back to those marginal tax rates. So generally, once you're retired and you're not working and bringing in as much income, your tax bracket is lower. And so hopefully you'll end up paying less tax overall. The other reason RRSPs are very useful is, um, is that you can use them in the home buyer's plan. So this is toward the purchase of your first home. Um, I won't go into more detail about the rules. You do have to put that money back eventually, but it is a, a helpful plan to, to help uh, first time home buyers. Then at age 71, which is long, long, long time away for all of you guys, um, you actually are forced to begin withdrawing and it's converted to something called a RIP which stands for Registered Retirement Investment Fund. You can't contribute to an RRSP anymore beyond age 71. So what about TFSA? So most of you probably heard that such a thing exists. So it stands for Tax-Free Savings Account, but really what it should be called is a, is a tax-free investment account. Um, anyone 18 or more uh, years of age can contribute. Um, regardless of income, so it's not like an RSP where it's a percentage of your salary. Um, and this program started in 2009. So if you were 18 years old in 2009, you would have the maximum contribution room, which in 2019 would be 63,000. So each year the government decides what the TFSA limit is. Uh, currently it's uh, 6,000 and it goes up in $500 increments uh, with inflation. In 2015, we had a $10,000 TFSA limit with the Harper government, but then it went back down to 5,500. And so that's where it's sort of been since then. 
So you, unlike the RRSP, you don't get a tax deduction when you contribute to a TFSA, but it grows tax-free. And this is the beauty of the TFSA and why it's such a powerful savings um, investment vehicle. You don't pay any tax at all when you withdraw the money. You can take the money out. It's not like locked in until you're a certain age, but don't. It's just such a powerful uh, vehicle that it should be left in there to grow. There's also our ESPs. I'm not gonna go into more details. These are registered education savings plans. So if you have children, you can start saving for their education. There's a government matching grant that, that um, um, that is applied to our ESPs. And then also on that initial slide, I mentioned there's the corporation. That's the other sort of bucket where you can save and invest. And we'll talk more about corporations later. So what about types of investments? So I mentioned RSPs, TFSAs, they're not investments. They're the buckets that you put your investments in. What can you put in them? Well, there's stocks or equity. So I think most of us understand that a stock or an equity is part ownership of a company. So things like Apple or Amazon, if you buy shares, you become a part owner of that company. Bonds are agreements with corporations and governments that pay interest. They're much less volatile, meaning they, go, they don't go up and down as much as stocks do. And Paul's gonna cover that a bit more. And there's mutual funds that you may have heard of. These are generally collections of stocks and bonds that are usually actively managed and we'll define what actively managed means later on. And generally um, they're, they're fairly high fees um, that you have to pay to own them. An index is a list or a basket of stocks. So many of you may have heard of the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, and really what it is, it's, it's just a collection of, of stocks all together. And then exchange traded funds or ETFs, that's an index that can be bought just like a single stock. Um, and it's one fund that may contain hundreds or thousands of stocks and bonds. And it's considered to be a passive investment versus an active, uh, actively managed fund. And, Again, we'll define that a little bit later. And generally, these have very low fees. Real estate, I mean, we all know what owning real estate is. Um, uh, what we talk to people about is that you, you do have to consider that uh, unlike other investments that you can just buy and have in your different investment accounts, owning an actual property is much like running a business. It requires a lot more work that, that comes with it. And so it's always a good idea to understand the time and effort that might be involved. Um, so this is just, um, this is again, just showing you some examples of um, some exchange traded funds. Um, there's, uh, there's now these all in one funds, which have both, uh, both equity stocks and bonds lumped together that can all be bought as, uh, as one single uh, ETF. And um, also, if you're into real estate, there's something called a REIT, which stands for Real Estate Investment Trust, which again, you can buy just like an ETF, uh, an exchange traded fund, but it's, uh, it deals with real estate properties. But it doesn't come with the work of having to fix toilets and, and find tenants. So what are the top five financial mistakes uh, that we see uh, physicians and, and trainees and medical students make. So number one is failure to control debt. And um, I know that it's not always the exciting part of the talk to, to discuss saving money and controlling debt. Everybody wants to know how to invest and how to make money quickly. But really we, we try to um, impress upon people how important it is to have good financial literacy in terms of saving and budgeting because you can't become financially independent if you don't save because you have to actually have money saved in order to invest it. So what we sometimes hear from, from residents is, is they'll say things like, my debt is so big, I can't really pay it off soon and I've just accepted I'm gonna have it for a very long time. And they go, you know, go along their way. So, What's important to talk about is what we call the compound interest beast. So we've all done lots and lots of math, um, but 
we all pretty much understand what compound interest is. And, and that's the concept where each year you pay interest on the principal that you borrowed, but also on the interest that has accumulated on that debt. So then the following year, not only are you paying interest on the principal, but also on the interest. And it grows and grows and grows over time and that's compounding. And so every unnecessary dollar that you spend when you're a resident or early career staff will compound against you. And so $100 spent now will become $200 in the future. So again, that's not to say you can't ever spend money on anything fun, but it's just, it's a good thing to keep in mind and a motivation to get on top of, um, of, of debt that some people have a hard time um, doing. Lifestyle inflation when you become staff is, is a real thing. So um, here's that Tesla again. <laughs> So, you know, we work really, really hard, residency, medical school, we work nights. And so oftentimes when people become staff and get that grown up doctor salary, they feel like now is the time I deserve this and I, you know, I need to treat myself. And certainly that's, that's true and you should treat yourself, but some people I would argue go a little maybe overboard and get the giant house and, you know, the $2,000 shoes and, you know, the $200,000 Tesla. And um, what we generally recommend is, especially if you have debt, uh, you're best off to live like a resident after you become staff. Until you get that debt under control, you will be on such better financial footing for the rest of your career if you manage to stay disciplined with your spending early on. Again, people don't like to talk about this all that often, but um, uh, living frugally makes a difference. So, um, you know, Paul and I come from very humble backgrounds. He's the first person in his family to go to university. There wasn't a lot of financial help there. So he had debt. My parents, we came, my parents were educated, but we came to Canada when I was 10 years old, spoke no English at all. We lived under the poverty line for many years. And again, they would have loved to have helped me, but couldn't. And so, so living frugally was just second nature. It was a necessity. And it's something that we now teach our kids. Our kids are now 11 and 16 and we go to the grocery store and we, we price match, not because we have to, and we can't afford regular price strawberries, but if you can just by using an app, um, you know, scroll through and make a few clicks and save, you know, $3 here and there, that's a useful skill for our kids to have. Maybe they're not going to become high income earners, but they will have these skills that they can then use in their, in their own lives. So li living frugally is, is something that can get you ahead financially. So there's the latte factor. So we've all heard about this concept where there is a very high cost to small but periodic spending. That $5, you know, Starbucks latte, it adds up. Um, you can save on transportation. It's not always possible. You might be in a rural residency program where you absolutely need a car, but then you don't have to have the Tesla. But, you know, a good old five-year-old reliable Honda Civic may do the job. Um, housing, if you can live close to work, that's ideal. Um, sometimes living with your family, which sometimes unpleasant, is, is uh, financially beneficial. Um, and buying secondhand. And, you know... What I like about all of these factors, the living frugally factors, is that many of them overlap very nicely with being environmentally friendly, right, and being green. And um, we get lots and lots of questions about, you know, environmental investments and how do I, you know, how, how do I invest responsibly? But this is also where being environmentally responsible is, right? Not getting those disposable cups every single day of coffee and buying things secondhand. So um, also with interest rates, you should all have, if you have a line of credit, your rate should be prime minus 0.25%. So currently prime is 3.95%. You should not be paying more than that on your, on your line of credit. If you are, you have to head over to the bank and negotiate. And we had this happen in, in our group where people have over time all managed to, I've 
Sometimes they had to leave a bank to get that rate, but make sure you get this rate. It will save you a lot of money in the long run and really it's not that much effort to, to negotiate it. And don't allow the bank to move you off this rate even as staff, negotiate, it's possible, it's been done. So I'm going to hand it over to Paul and he'll tell you about the other top five mistakes. So again, thank you for having us. It is really nice for us to see that this is getting so much traction that 150 of you uh, have shown up tonight to, uh, to hear what we have to say. Um, it's, it's really important to us. And I think these skills are going to be really important, especially for this group when we talk to medical students and residents. And the main reason is, and I think that's something that my generation has to understand in medicine, is that we've had it a lot easier than you, you are going to have it. Medicine is really changing. Uh, fee structures are, pay, are changing. We're getting paid less. There are now different professions who are taking over parts of our job uh, that we're not going to have. Uh, for you, housing is more expensive. Fees are more expensive to be a physician. So it's all changing and you're really going to have to have these self-defense skills. So it's so good to see everyone here uh, and everyone being on top of it uh, because it's so much more of a challenge. And it's also a challenge for us. We're trying to convince the you know, middle-aged physicians like us that it is much harder for the people behind us. And we have to do our best to, to help them to pass on skills uh, and sort of open doors for them. So the fact that you're here and everyone's demanding this, I think is great Keep doing it. So I'm going to talk now about the mistakes that we see. And one of the big ones that are, we run into, Jane and I are talking all across the, the country now and, and giving talks to physician groups. And the big issue that we're seeing is whole life insurance. Uh, whole life insurance, you definitely need some sort of insurance. There's no way around that, but you have to be careful. And there are a lot of unethical insurance brokers out there who will try to sell you expensive products that you don't need. I remember when I was a medical student, there were people who would buy us lunch and show up and give us an insurance talk and they would be allowed into the medical school to do it. Some financial advisors or wealth management firms are gonna put pressure on you to buy big policies as tax savings, as a tax saving measure. Don't believe it. I'm gonna walk you through what you need to know when you are inevitably approached as a young staff saying that you need a, a policy and what you need for insurance. So let's talk about what you actually need as far as insurance. So term life insurance, if you have dependents, so if you have children, if you have a spouse who has a, a lower earning potential, you need a life insurance. If you have debt and others have co-signed your loans, you need life insurance. Because obviously if you die and someone has co-signed your loan, they're still on the hook to pay it even though you're gone and your earning potential is gone. But what you need is something called term life insurance. Term life insurance covers you for a period of time. So you buy a policy that may be for 10 or 20 years, and when that time period is up, you are no longer insured. You need it during the period where you have dependents. That's important that they're looked after when you're gone, when you're gone. but you don't need life insurance for your whole life. I'm gonna talk about why. You need automobile insurance. I think everyone understands that. You need insurance on your residence. Uh, you need disability. As a medical student, I think you should have a small amount. Uh, as a medical student, if you were injured right now and you weren't able to finish, then obviously you're not gonna have that same earning potential. You need more when you're a resident, and then when you're staff, you're gonna have to consider increasing it even further. Your CMPA, obviously everyone needs CMPA and you can't practice without it, but inevitably, uh, every year in Canada, some resident lets their uh, CMPA lapse. And I don't know how you can possibly do that, but uh, people do it. So we're gonna do a little case study here, and the case study is around um, uh, whole life insurance. So uh, we're going to talk about whole life insurance. We're going to talk about a 30 year old psychiatrist. He is incorporated uh, in the first year of practice, uh, still has some debt, no RRSP, no TFSA, and a close friend from high school is an insurance agent and claims the following. It says, whole life insurance allows removal of money from your corporation tax free. It's better than an RRSP. It's all you need. You don't need an RRSP. You don't need a TFSA. All you need is one of these whole life insurance policies. He suggests that the corporation, Dr. Holhead's corporation, buy a policy that's going to cost $4,100 a month, about $50,000 a year, and the corporation can pay for it. 
the policy will be worth millions when Dr. Holhead dies and that will pass to his children tax-free. Dr. Holhead can take a loan out against the value of the policy and spend the value of this insurance policy tax-free while, while he's still alive. Whole life insurance is a problem. It's one of the biggest problems that we're seeing. Every time we speak at an event across Canada, someone will come up afterwards and say, oh my gosh, I own one of these whole life and policies, insurance policies, what do I do? Uh, we recently saw you know, a uh, young staff who was in her 30s who had no dependents, no spouse, yet was sold a life insurance policy that will cover her for her entire life. It's simply unnecessary. The truth is you're not going to be able to access this money easily. Once you pay it, it is tied up. Borrowing against the policy, which you'll be told you can do, is actually much harder and there are high fees to do it. And that most people who buy these whole life insurance policies do not keep the policy until they die. Uh, they end up leaving early. In fact, 80% of people who have these policies will leave it. That's called a lapse. Uh, and they never reach the end and they never really get the benefit of it. So if it's so bad, why is it sold so widely? Why do so many uh, young physicians have this? And the truth is that the agent who sells the policy uh, to the physician receives 110% of the first year's premiums as a fee. So this $50,000 a year policy, that agent uh, would make $55,000 in fees. So there is a huge incentive for insurance agents to sell these to you. They will try and convince you it's a good idea. They will show you projections that, uh, you know, that show it to be beneficial. Uh, but don't buy it. Uh, keep, uh, keep in mind what you've heard here and, uh, and second guess what you're being told. So the second thing that we run into uh, are a lot of physicians have high fee investments. So let's talk about this. Those of you that are in the, the group know that we talk a lot about this. It's one of the, the core values that we try and teach people. The thing about physicians is that we are a trusting profession. We know that many physicians are not good with money. I don't think that's a big secret. Um, but we're used to this model that we work under. So you're working in a hospital. You know, I'm an emergency physician. So if I have a bad wrist fracture that I can't reduce, uh, what do I do? I call orthopedics. I get a consult. They come, they take care of the problem, they take care of the patient. And so we're used to this model. So when we don't know something, we fall back on it. So you'll be a practicing physician, you'll be making money, you're gonna to say to yourself, you know what, I don't know all of this investment stuff. I don't know how to do that. I'm just gonna pay someone to do it well so I don't make a mistake. The problem is that this assumes a fiduciary duty. Fiduciary duty is something that we understand. It's the idea that we're gonna put the patient's uh, best interests ahead of our own. I'm not gonna do a procedure on a patient just because it pays me well if they don't need it because I have a fiduciary duty to them. And so we're used to that. It's just second nature to us. And we assume that everyone else has it. But the truth is that the financial industry does not. Uh, a lot of financial advisors are not obligated to work in your best interest. And their best interest gets mixed in with what you're sold and what happens with your money. So one of the financial or one of the professionals you'll deal with is a financial advisor. They're going to tell you what to invest in. They'll make projections about your savings to meet your financial goals. And once you're ready to retire, they're going to help to rem uh, helps you remove your savings in a tax efficient way. But they may also want to sell you insurance products. And this is another thing that we're running into with certain financial advice firms. They are selling a, a large number of these whole life insurance policies to physicians. Paradoxically, a financial advisor can be very helpful to you and they have very important skills, but it's also professional you need to protect yourself from uh, the most because of the high fees. And we're gonna talk about fees now and how you pay them. So our story, I think a lot of you are in the group and, and maybe know a little bit about us, but we've been very critical of the financial industry and how they've treated doctors. Uh, unfortunately, deception has been the rule for decades uh, in Canada. Um, we uh, were featured in the Globe and Mail. Uh, there was an article where we've been critical of uh, MD Financial, uh, which is an organization that a lot of physicians interact with. Uh, we even posed for this uh, silly picture that uh, uh, ran in the uh, Globe and Mail. And we only agreed this, we knew we'd look silly, but we thought that maybe it would reach people that were not already reaching over social media, some older physicians. Um, and I have to tell you that um, if you're ever featured in an article and you're a doctor saying that you represent other doctors who are not happy with their financial advisor, 
Uh, and the story runs, don't work a night shift and then have the story run the next morning. So I didn't know when this was coming out. I worked a really bad Sunday overnight shift. I got hammered. I went uh, home to sleep. And this was the day that I forgot to put my phone on Do Not Disturb. And it ran on the front page of the business section on the Globe Mail. Now let me tell you that every financial advisor in the known universe will try and contact you. Uh, so I was getting calls uh, you know, on Facebook and Twitter, and I was getting calls through the hospital switchboard. Uh, but <laughs> I was. I, I'm not exaggerating. So, it's uh, this has sort of been could become uh, the thing that we're known for is is making sure that you're getting a fair shake from the financial industry. But some of you are going to say, okay, you know, my advisor works for a nonprofit organization, and they're really nice people because they gave me a backpack. <laughs> so the the question is, you know, with these companies that are associated and they're coming into the medical schools. Um, how did that happen? Where are they getting that, that lead in? Where are they getting that crack? Oop, back up here. Okay, I missed a slide. So some of you may have heard that MD Financial, which was previously owned by the Canadian Medical Association, the CMA is of course a nonprofit organization, which owned uh, MD Financial. And MD Financial was recently sold for $2.6 billion to Scotiabank. And a lot of physicians were sort of scratching their head because they were, hey, wait a second, they gave me the backpack. The tagline used to be, buy physicians for physicians. I always thought that this was sort of just some free privilege I got as being part of the CMA. Well, the truth is that MD Financial was never a nonprofit organization. It was a for-profit business uh, that sold to physicians at you know, retail prices for a lot of their investments. And when you ask yourself, you know, how did they get to be worth $2.6 billion? I'm gonna run through that, how that happened. And to put this in context, this little tiny boutique MD financial firm was, you know, Scotiabank paid $2.6 billion for this. The previous month, Scotiabank bought an entire Chilean national bank for only 2.5 billion. So how did this happen? How is this little boutique worth more than a Chilean bank? So, we're going to talk about how they got there, how they got to that point. So the first thing you need to understand is how your financial institution is paid. And there's two basic models. The first is something called an MER. If you buy a mutual fund, this is called the management expense ratio. It is basically a percentage that the company charges you to invest your money. It is a percentage of everything you turn over to them. It's not just a percentage of the profits they make. It is a percentage of everything you turn over. There's also another model called assets under management. It's very similar if you're not buying mutual funds, but you're turning money over to a financial institution, they will take a percentage of that uh, every year and invest it. So it's not the profits, it's all of the money you turn over, and it is every year that you will be paying this. And this is a percentage. This is the number that you have to know. So how do you know this number? You know, in the past, how did you know how much you were paying in fees? Well, the way you would have to know is, well, this has kind of been cut off here, but this is called uh, uh, a fund fact sheet. The title is, is cut off. And this is uh, from a, a well-known financial company. And every company that has a mutual fund has to pr put one of these fund fact sheets out. And when you look at the fund fact sheet, you'll see, wow, this is colorful, there's graphs, there's small print. How do I know what's important on this? Well, what's important is this area. At the top there, you'll see that there is a number called the management expense ratio. This is the number I'm talking about. This is the percentage that you're paying in order to have this investment. And in the past, this is the only way that you would have known what you were paying. You never received a statement saying that you paid this many thousands of dollars. You would have had to go find the fun fact sheet yourself, find that number, and then do the calculations. So let's talk about this number. I think at, at a basic level, everyone understands the simple idea of fees. If I invest $10,000 with a company and the MER is 1.79%, I'm paying them $179. Seems pretty small. But as the numbers get bigger, the fees get larger. Let's say you're an early staff and you have $100,000 to invest. You're paying about $1,800. You may say, well, that's not bad. I'm getting a little bit of advice from the financial advisor, uh, you know, and I'm investing. And this seems reasonable. 
But as the numbers grow and as your staff and have a larger portfolio of a million or five million, you see that the numbers start to get really scary. A $5 million portfolio, you're paying $89,500 in fees on that. So the simple fee explanation is scary enough, but the truth is it gets much, much worse. There's the compound fee explanation. So here what I've done is I've run a graph for you, and these are two different funds that you can invest in. The first one is a fund that uh, has an MER of 1.79%. That's the blue line. What I've done here is I've projected this is a 30 year old physician who's going to invest for 37 years and retire at the average age that physicians retire at, which is about 67. So they're gonna invest for 37 years and they're gonna invest about $27,000 a year. So this is not even a full RRSP contribution. It's a very conservative scenario. So the bottom line charges 1.79%. The top line is a low cost uh, index ETF and its fees are only 0.25%. And you can see here the simple fees and the compound fees, the difference starts to become apparent. So the low cost fund after 37 years is worth about $4 million. The high cost fund is worth only about $2.7 million. And I've assumed with these two funds that they had the same level of return. They're both returning about 6%. The only difference are the fees, the underlying fees involved. So if you summarize that, the high fee fund, you're gonna pay $710,000. The low fee fund, you pay 130,000. But the overall difference in your portfolio, the amount of money that you have at the end is about $1.3 million. So that's why fees are so important. So I mentioned there an index fund and an exchange traded fund, and some of you may not know what those are. Uh, an index is inexpensive. It is just a list of, or a basket of funds as Jane talked about. So you have a stock exchange, you take a list of say 500 funds like the S&P 500, and you buy them and you hold them. And an index is cheap because there's no one there that you have to pay to try and buy and sell, you know, to buy low and sell high, to do research. You're simply buying this list of stocks and you're holding it for decades. And without expensive managers or research teams or anyone else taking a cut, you can get a very low cost investment that works well. Uh, there are different ones that you'll hear about. If you're part of our group, you'll hear people talk a lot about the Vanguard all-in-one funds. Uh, Bank of Montreal has all-in-one index ETFs. iShares has the same thing. There are multiple providers. We don't recommend one over the other. They're all excellent, uh, but it's definitely something that you need to look at because it can reduce your investment costs. So another really important concept I want you to understand is active versus passive management. Because when you're approached by a financial advisor, the basic idea that you're gonna be sold is yes, you're paying us fees, but we know the market so well that you're actually going to pay that fee, but we're gonna make you more money because we understand how to make money in that market. And the benefit to you, you'll actually make more than you pay us in fees. That is the argument for active management. The idea that people who are buying and selling stocks frequently, uh, who have expertise, the idea that these fund managers can charge fees because they will get you better returns in the market. They believe their skill will offer higher returns. That's active management. Passive management is what we've talked about. You buy an index, you buy a long list of stocks that are diversified across different geographies, uh, and uh, that are wide ranging and you buy them and you hold them uh, and it contains hundreds or thousands of stocks in one single investment and there's no one else that you have to pay there's no middleman between you and the investments and these are two important concepts passive management is what we encourage active management is something that you're going to hear a lot about from the industry but I want you to be very critical of it and, and understand some of the reasons why it's probably not true Active management doesn't work, okay? Uh, passive uh, investing has overwhelming evidence supporting it. And if you're gonna be anti-passive uh, investing, it's kind of like being anti-vaccine. Uh, <laughs> 75 to 90% of active funds do not beat the comparable index that they are compared to. So the fancy Bay Street guy in his big suit and his fancy car in the tall tower uh, is not actually going to beat the index. 
And this is a very controversial idea when you talk to them about it, but the evidence is overwhelming. Um, your financial advisor is going to tell you different than this. They're going to poo-poo passive investing. So let me go through the evidence. There's an important website that you can go to if you're interested in the underlying evidence behind it. It's called Spiva. What they do is they take the S&P 500, which is an index, and they compare it to every actively managed fund in North America. So we're talking thousands of funds. So if you were to walk into an RBC and buy a mutual fund from them, if you're going to go to another company like MD Financial and buy from them, every actively managed fund is compared to the indexes. So let's look at this. So here they've taken the United States and they've taken every actively managed fund in the US and they've compared it to an appropriate index benchmark. And what we see is that over five years, 76% of actively managed funds won't beat the index. Okay? And some of you are going to say, well, you know, that's the United States and, you know, they're very capitalistic and I'm sure that, you know, that's what's going on there. But you're actually wrong because when we look at Canada, it's actually much worse. So in Canada, 90%, 89% of the funds, 90% will not beat the passive fund that they follow. The reason it's worse in Canada is the reason that active management doesn't work in the first place. It's because of fees. The fees in Canada are so high that it is, a re it is really difficult for an actively managed fund to beat the index. So that's really important to understand. Everyone, you know, if I put up graphs and pictures, uh, people are, are reasonably interested, but everyone loves a story. So I'm going to tell you one here, and this is a story of active versus passive investing. Uh, anytime you do a financial presentation, there is an unwritten rule that you must have a picture of Warren Buffett somewhere in your presentation. So this helps me to meet the requirement because I have Warren Buffett now here. But basically Warren Buffett uh, made a, a bet. He came out to all takers and said, listen, I am a, you know, an experienced active investor. He's probably one of the most you know, experienced and successful active investors uh, in, in recent history. And he said, this is what I've done, but he, I don't think that's what most people should do with their investing. He advocates that most people invest in passive, low-cost index funds. And I know you've heard that idea before from someone, but <laughs> this is what he advocates for people. And he said, listen, I'm going to put up a million dollars of my own money here. If anyone else wants to take the bet, you put up a million dollars as well. I'm going to invest my million dollars in a low-cost S&P 500 index fund. You can invest your million dollars in whatever you like. After 10 years, we're going to compare balances. And we're going to compare balances after fees. Whoever has more money wins it all, takes it, and you can give it to the charity of your choice. So how did the bet go? There was someone who took them on, a group called Protégé Partners. They're just what you would imagine from a hedge fund, the fancy suits, the you know, exclusive address, all of that swagger that goes with it, and also the fees that go with it as well. They work on what's called a 20 and 2 model. They take 20% of the profits and 2% of everything that's turned over to them. So how did this go? How did this do after 10 years? Well, when you look at the graph, uh, Warren Buffett's S&P 500 back in 2008, 2007 is when this started. Uh, the orange line follows his S&P 500 index investment and the gray line follows the hedge fund. But you can see in the first couple of years, it looked like Warren Buffett was going to lose. He wasn't going to do well. Uh, but over time, you'll see that the orange line starts to pass, to pass the gray one. And the reason is that over time, fees hold back the hedge fund and they had no hope of beating the passive index fund. So this is why we need to be so careful with fees and why we need to be so aware. And when something is, you know, a piece of paper is slid across the desk for you to sign, make sure that you're looking at the fine print and you're understanding what you buy. So the other big mistake we see with, uh, with physicians, and I'm actually going to say that this is more important than the high fee investments. We talked a lot about high fee investments, but investing behavior is critical. And if you're someone who can't get the investing behavior right, then you may need a financial advisor and you may need to actually pay higher fees, but investing behavior is critical. So let's talk about the mistakes that they make. So first of all, this is a graph of what the stock market has done from 1900 to 2000. And a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, oh my gosh, there's no possible way I could do this. Look at these ups and downs. Now here we have in 1929, followed by the depression, the huge crash, we have wars, we have inflationary period, you know, we have the dot-com boom, all of these things are here. But the thing about it is, 
If you look in the short term, there are lots of ups and, ups and downs. And what I say to people is that in the short term, uh, the stock market is a roller coaster. But in the long term, when you look at the overall trajectory, uh, it's actually an escalator. Uh, and so this is something that you have to keep in mind. When you are a long-term investor, you do well. And this is the first principle that physicians have to understand when they're investing. You have to be a long-term investor. There's no such thing uh, as a quick win. There's no such thing as easy money or quick money. So this is something else. Uh, in my YouTube videos, I use this same uh, graph, but I think it's critical to understand. It looks a little bit complicated. All it is is basically the rolling returns. So what this graph does is on the bottom, we have all the years from 1926 to about 2003. What this allows you to do uh, is, oops, I lost my cursor here. So basically, you can pick a year uh, and then scroll up and it'll give you a number. And what it says that if you had invested in say 1967, invested and left that money for a 10 year period, how much would you have made per year? So in this case, you would have made about 7% per year. And the purpose of this graph is not for me to go back and say, yes, these are the characteristics you should look for and this is what you need to do you know, to get a higher return. What I want you to take away from this graph is the number of 10 year periods where you actually would have lost money if you had held money for 10 years. You can see you can count them on one hand. There's about five negative periods where if you'd held for 10 years, you would have lost money. So this is why buy and hold is so powerful. There's no point in pretending that because the coronavirus is here, you know now, you now know when to sell and when to buy in order to make money. So do not panic if the stock market drops. You know, this, uh, this idea that we talk about, about whatever the latest, greatest thing is that's affecting the stock market, over the last two years, we've had to throw up different pictures. Either it's Donald Trump, or it's Brexit, or it's, you know, now, uh, you know, COVID-19. But what I want to show you with this is, this is why everyone panics. Look at this graph. This is terrifying. This is a six-month uh, return on the TSX. And you can see that we were having this nice period of growth. And then all of a sudden, uh, coronavirus hits. And then we just hit this cliff. And this is what terrifies people. This is what makes everyone want to act. So it makes everyone want to log into their account and sell everything they have. The problem is, is that you need to look at the next slide. Because here we have the graph I just showed you. This is the six month period. This is the same thing, but this is over a five year period. And you'll see, this is the same drop off here but you see how tiny it is in comparison to the previous growth. So we have to get past this short-term thinking. You need to be a long-term investor with all of your investments. Don't try uh, to buy low and sell high. You're always going to lose. Where you buy and hold, the odds and the evidence say that you will do quite well. Do not panic if the stock market drops. I can't uh, emphasize that enough. Stock market fluctuations are normal. They are expected. If the stock market drops, the correct response is for you to do absolutely nothing. Buy and hold investments when new money becomes available. When you're working and cash starts to build up and you're ready to invest it, invest it. It does not matter what the market is doing. It doesn't matter if it's up or down. <clears throat> if you have money in the market, remember, you don't lose any money until you sell your investments. The market will recover given time. You don't care what the stock market does tomorrow. You don't care what it does a month from now. You don't even care what it does five years from now. All you care about is in 20 years, when you're ready to retire and you need to access that money, uh, is you care what it's doing at the 20 year period, not what it's doing in those shorter time frames. So this is the phrase that I try and get everyone to remember. It's buy, hold, chill, win. Uh, you need to view all of your investments as long-term. Do not invest money if you're gonna need it in the next five years. That's not what long-term stock market investing is about. Uh, if you have something you need money for in the next five years, if you're saving for a home, uh, then it stays in a high interest savings account. Consider the money you invest locked up for a 20 year period. You're not going to touch it. And, sorry, it's just uh, jumping on me here. Uh, avoid high risk investments. This is the other thing that doctors just, it's like a, a it's like the mermaid song. They just, they, they can't get away from it. The, the siren song is just too good. The pull is too strong. If an investment sounds too good to be true, it usually is. 
And of course, there's the physician Facebook group used an alleged multi-million dollar fraud. That is not us. <laughs> um, this was a, you know, a physician, a, I think a couple of physicians who started a Facebook dads group and then, you know, convinced everyone to invest with them uh, in a very high risk investment that was supposedly returning double digit returns, uh, you know, on a monthly period. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Um, stick to the boring, low cost index investments that you hold for a long time. You're going to be a high income person. Uh, you're going to be very wealthy. You simply don't have to take a lot of risk and it's just not worth it at the end. So <clears throat> the last mistake I, I want to talk about that comes up a lot is the money family trap. Uh, and I would ask a lot of you to just have pause uh, when you are dealing with... Uh, hold on. All right, here we go. One, good. So the money family trap is family expectations put pressure on you towards lifestyle inflation. Hey, you're a doctor now. Shouldn't you own a detached house in downtown Toronto? Uh, your family and friends may be after your cash flow. Hey, you're a doctor now. We need to invest this. We need to get this business off the ground. You can help me. Hey, I'm your brother. Uh, these are all things that... <laughs> uh, you know, these are things that you need to be very, very careful of, and you need to have pause. Um, sometimes people will have assumptions about your income, about what you're going to do for that. Um, my advice is that you should think twice, and you often shouldn't do anything. Um, the other thing is that the fa your family may make you feel like you are responsible for everyone's well-being in the family. You are the retirement plan. Um, you know, we helped you through medical school. You don't have any loans because of us. And now you have, we have an expectation that you'll help us. Um, and again, this darn brother, he's really stuck again. Um, can't you just help him out? Choose your spouse wisely. This is really hard to do. <laughs> I have no advice to tell you exactly how to do that, other than be careful. Um, consider prenuptial cohabitation agreements. Again, not the most romantic thing in the world. Uh, but something that you might want to give some thought to, depending on your circumstances. So Jane is now going to talk to you about uh, transition to practice. All right. So we advocate for a fairly simple financial plan for most people. So again, that living frugally comes up, paying off your debt, maximizing tax sheltered investments like the RSPs and TFSAs that we talked about. When those are full, you then can consider incorporation and we'll talk about that. And as Paul was just talking about, we advocate for investing in low cost exchange traded funds in an evidence-based way. And you've seen some evidence tonight as to, as to why that's the way to go. All right, so finally, we've alluded to incorporation a few times tonight. So, so what is incorporation? So when you incorporate, essentially what you are doing is you're creating a CCPC, which stands for a Canadian Controlled Professional Corporation. It's a legal entity that you control. The reason that you're doing it is, I'm not gonna go into all the numbers, but basically the whole point is, is that corporations pay a much lower tax rate. And you have to remember, though, that the corporation's money is not actually your money. Um, some of that money belongs to the government, and the government is not going to like it when you spend it, just like that tax bill at, for your first year of staff. So a corporation is not tax-free, but what it does is sort of in a similar way like the RRSP, it allows you to delay or defer paying taxes, because each year you're paying a much smaller proportion in taxes in the corporation and so more of your income can stay within it and grow. So when you incorporate, you agree to flow all of your income that you earn into the corporation. And the way that you would set this up, you can either hire a lawyer and uh, do it through a lawyer or the OMA actually has a very robust incorporation service now. When we incorporated back in 2007, 2006, um, our accountant advised that we should really do it through a lawyer. He felt that uh, the OMA didn't really have a lot of experience with it yet and had seen some set up badly, but um, they'd really had quite a bit of experience with it. 
So that is an option. Again, we don't advocate going one way or another, but it, it is something that's a much lower cost uh, to do through the OMA. And then, so if it's the corporation that gets all your income, how do you actually get paid? Like how do you buy a couch or how do you, you know, buy a house? So the corporation will then pay you either through salary, which remember I have the little RRSP piggy here, that's how you earn RRSP contribution room or with something called dividends. Again, this is too detailed to go into, into much more depth, but that is how money is distributed distributed to you personally from the corporation. The rest can stay in there, in the corporation, um, be invested and then paid out at a later date. So this probably could be a sixth mistake that we see very often uh, with physicians is that some physicians um, are sort of uh, pushed to incorporate a bit early. Um, What's important to understand is that incorporation actually used to be far more beneficial before 2018, but uh, in 2018, certain tax changes were made that um, took away income splitting benefits with a lower earning spouse as well as other things. And so really the drive to incorporate early, uh, some of that disappeared. So really you should focus on filling your RRSPs and your TFSAs first and uh, understand that once you incorporate this will actually increase the accounting costs and paperwork for you so you don't want to do it too early because if you remember that that slide i had up about the cost of an accountant it's much much higher for someone who is incorporated it's just a far more complicated tax return for your accountant to prepare so the costs are much more significant and generally you need at least about $100,000 or so to be sitting in the corporation to justify the ex extra expenses of filing a corporate tax return. You have to do other annoying things like keeping a corporate minute book, which you can pay a lawyer to do, or actually it's quite easy to do it yourself. We have templates in our group that you can, you can use and that'll save you about three, $400 a year for a simple document you can print off in five minutes. So what are a few other tips uh, transitioning to practice? Well, you want to apply if you're going to work in Ontario for your CPSO license and a billing number as soon as you can. We're so far removed from it, you want to talk to early career staff as to what the current timelines are, but generally you first need your CPSO license and then you apply for your billing number and you need your billing number in order to bill and get paid. Learning how to bill properly, I can't emphasize how important this is. The best way to learn is to harness the wisdom of some of your colleagues in your specialty and, and ask and ask several staff because unfortunately the schedule of benefits, which is sort of this very complicated document that we have to try and sort through to, to understand what the bill OHIP, it's, it's not that straightforward. And so there are many different interpretations so talk to different staff and you're going to hear different opinions, um, but learn how to bill properly. I have colleagues who for years were, you know, not billing. I, you know, I'm a pediatrician. They were billing regular pediatric ward codes when they could have been billing NICU intensive care uh, codes, which were much more valuable. And they just didn't take the time to learn and lost out on a lot of income. And you can't go back and say, hey, OHIP, can you pay me back what I didn't claim? After a claim um, has gone in, six months later, it's stale dated. Doesn't matter, they don't care they, how much you appeal. After six months, the claim is old, they will never pay you again. Um, hiring an accountant uh, experience with physicians, this is coming up again. Um, keeping things organized. So that will include things like having a separate business credit card, having a separate business bank account, and uh, that's gonna reduce your, your costs. So reviewing your insurance needs. So Paul mentioned the types of insurance that you need. So when you transition to staff, you may need to increase your disability insurance. You may need to increase your life insurance if you are maybe now have a spouse and perhaps uh, children even. If there are contracts, if you are working within a group and there's a contract, understand the contract before you sign it. Again, this comes up very, very often where physicians have started working 
in a clinic, they, you know, they don't look at the contract, they don't understand the contract, and, and that sometimes gets them into trouble where they lose out financially. If you don't understand the contract, have an employment lawyer look it over. Um, if you employ staff, you have an administrative assistant, a business manager, have contracts that are drawn up properly because again, trying to hire fire employees can be very unpleasant. And if you are protected with a good contract, that will serve you well. And again, here's our guy that bought the Tesla with his uh, income staff uh, or income um, salary. Uh, don't forget that tax bill. Um, there is a CMPA reimbursement that you have to apply for. So this is something to be aware of. So each month, um, you have to pay your CMPA dues. As Paul mentioned, you have to have to pay these, otherwise you'll be asked to leave. As soon as anyone finds out, you're not covered. And you can apply to have uh, actually much of this reimbursed. So there's an agreement with the government which you get reimbursed for the portion back down to the 1986 rates. That's currently our agreement with the government. It won't be around forever, but our monthly fees are actually very, very high but this reimbursement makes them a bit more reasonable. So don't forget to apply for this. Okay, so we're nearing the end of the talk. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some resources. Um, and these resources are organized in a most passive manner to the most active manner. So the, you can learn from Diffusion, the first couple resources, and then active is like sitting down and reading a book. Um, so obviously, you know, um, Jay and Paul and their Facebook group. Um, I also run an Instagram blog where I blog about finance uh, topics. And just to keep in mind, neither of us take sponsorships from industry. Um, there's also, if you're in family medicine, there's also the first five years in family practice groups. And I'm sure there are equivalent Facebook group groups for other specialties as well. Um, but I'm not in those specialties. So if there are, feel free to let me know. Um, Reddit, also very passive. You're just scrolling through Reddit, looking at pictures of cats or whatever. So you can just um, go on, follow the subreddit, uh, Personal Finance uh, Canada. Oh, there we go. Whoops. Um, and then, um, and then there's also uh, subreddit Personal Finance, um, as well as Financial Independence and Poverty Finance for people who um, don't come from very um, high means. There are also forums like Pre-Med 101, as you guys know, um, Mr. Money Mustache and White Coat Investor. Um, when it comes to podcasts, so if you guys are on the bus or working out, um, Canadian Couch Potato is a really good one to learn about robo advisors and um, about ETFs. White Coat Investor has a really good podcast episode on resident finances. Uh, and the other three are more towards maybe like a beat women and money um, newly graduates uh, in debt and journey to launch is more for if you want to look at um, the intersection between race and uh, finance as well. Um, websites, so Canadian Couch Potato and Canadian Portfolio Manager are good resources, as well as Looney Doctor, who is one of our own in the um, uh, PFI group. Um, and these websites, just keep in mind that when you start off with them, it's a little intimidating because there's a lot of material. But if you're looking for something really specific, um, they're a good resource to use. And finally, the most active learning thing. So um, when it comes to books, uh, this one that's kind of blocked here is Beat the Bank um, and Broke Millennial. These two are written in 2017. Um, so they might cater to a more um, updated crowd. And then the classics, which are like Millionaire Teacher and The Millionaire Next Door. I really like them because um, they're very evidence-based in how, they, uh, how they're written. So that comes to the end of the presentation. Um, so maybe we'll give five minutes just to get food and take a washroom break. And then when you guys come back, um, we're going to do the question and answer period.